Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Cardigan Cowboy. My name is Taos, and I am so excited to be here. Me and my team, we have worked a we've worked a lot. We've worked hard hours trying to get right here to this point where we have a listener listening to us get our voice in your ear. That sounds kind of dirty, but we're going to go with it. We're going to go with it. And the main thing we just want you guys to pull from this is you are appreci- you are so appreciated. And we hope to bring value through good conversation, give you those good vibes, great advice, all in the name of philanthropy. And by that, I mean, we have made a vow that half of the money that comes through our bank account here at Cardigan Cowboy, half of it goes to a nonprofit. We don't choose the nonprofit. Here's where it gets cool. Our guest chooses the nonprofit. So if you're a guest on our show, you get to choose where the money goes. So it makes the guest look like a badass. We feel like a badass. And as a listener, you should feel like one too, because without you, this would not be possible. Also, how this works is we have awesome sponsors. The sponsors that are sponsoring me right now are even more awesome, awesomer. I don't know if that's a word, but we're going to use it because they are. And why they are is they believe in the Cardigan Cowboy and myself before it was ever even anything. And these sponsors are fully aware that the money that they give to the Cardigan Cowboy goes to a nonprofit. They back us and they love us and they've given us support. And so therefore, I feel like you guys need to hear about them. Just like in the show of Joe Rogan's show, if you've ever listened to him, Joe Rogan starts the show out for about three to five minutes talking about his sponsors, and then he leaves you alone for the rest of the podcast. And we're fully aware that you can go ahead and hit skip, go right into the episode. That's great. If you feel like doing something good or great or awesome today, all you have to do is listen, and you can listen to the beginning and hear if these sponsors provide a product or a service that you could use. If you can, let them know Cardigan Cowboys sent you. You will get a deal. We get a deal. They get a deal. We're all happy, and it all goes for a great cause. So we love you. We appreciate you. Thank you for being here. Also, I want to mention, we are only as good as our feedback. I have a website, cardigancowboy.com. You can go to cardigancowboy.com, and you can email us. You can also email me personally at taos, T-A-O-S, just to see away from being tacos, yo. Taos at cardigancowboy.com. I think I got that right. Taos at cardigancowboy.com. Email me. If this affects you, if this brings value, if you like what we're doing, if you don't like what we're doing, be gentle. But let us know. Give us that feedback. We would love to hear from you. Also, if you feel like you know somebody that would be great on this podcast, let me know. Send them to me. We'll talk it out. If you feel that you have a product that we would love and that we would back up and allow you to be a sponsor of this show, let me know. Email me. We want to support great people doing great things, whether that's a sponsor, that's a guest, or that's a listener. So we want to open communication, transparent platform that you guys can talk to us, we can talk to you, and we all get better in doing just that. So something really cool. Shorties, Kaboy, Hattery. These guys are out of Oklahoma City. We love their hats. They're, the, they're like the Ferrari of hats. And I know you're probably there like thinking, well, I already look like a million bucks. There's nothing wrong with two million bucks, right? Put one of their hats on, automatic, a million dollars more on whatever you look like now, man. They are awesome. From bottom to top, start to stop, custom handmade cowboy hats right out of Oklahoma City. If you're not in Oklahoma City, that's okay. You can hit them up on Instagram. That's what I found best. Find it at Shorty's Kaboy Hattery. Kaboy spelled C-A-B-O-Y. You can find them. You can go, you can hit their link, You can or you can message them. They will ask for your measurements. You can send them in. So you don't have to be here in Oklahoma to enjoy Shorty's product. You can just hit them up, send them your measurements. I think they have a really cool story of three sisters out in California. Got these custom hats. They're beautiful. I think they're on their Instagram. You should check them out. And uh, yeah, they're all about quality. Something really cool about Shorty's is Shorty is actually a woman, and she's the first woman to own a hat company, a cowboy hat company in the U.S., possibly the world. I'm going to go ahead and say world. Yeah, the world sounds good. She's the first woman to own a cowboy hat company in the world. She's awesome and so cool, and I got to sit down with her and talk to her. She also represents and and started a, non, a nonprofit called Rain in Cancer where they help cancer patients, which is really awesome. She's a cancer survivor. Her sister uh, sadly passed from it, but the, the nonprofit was started in her name and raises tons of money to help those diagnosed with cancer. So 
Go to Shorty's. Let them know that the Cardigan Cowboys sent you. You will love it. You will not regret it. I totally believe that. And uh, yeah, get your hat on. Our next sponsor, Midwest Land Group. This Midwest Land Group out of Bristow, Oklahoma, they're ran by a guy named Zane Goodwin. Zane happens to be a very good friend of mine. He's a mentor. He means a lot to me. And he runs a top-notch real estate company. He is awesome. You can reach him at 918-771-0077. And whenever you holler at him, let him know if the Cardigan Cowboys sent you. If you're a seller, they'll look at your asset. They'll look at your land. They'll tell you what it's worth. If you're a buyer, they promise you they will find the land or the ranch or the farm or the home of your dreams. They are awesome. They are top-notch. Also, he runs a ranch. He knows what he's talking about. He has four little ones, Ryder, Roan, Risden, Rainy. They are so cool. They're hunting. They're fishing. They're very active kids. Their daddy's awesome, and I think you guys should know about them and go get your land. So I've got you a hat. I've got you your land. Right? My last sponsor. Okie. Okay. This brand is right here out of Tulsa, Oklahoma. They make phenomenally cool hats. Go to their website. You can find them at Okie. I think it's The Okie Brand on Instagram. They have a link right under their name. Hit it. I don't even think it leaves Instagram. It takes you right to the store. You can go through and pick from all these awesome hats. They have every kind. They have the flat bills. They have the snapbacks. They also have the dad hat. And oddly enough, I feel like everybody knows what that is, and it's kind of an unspoken thing, right? Yeah, they have the dad hat. Dad hats are cool. They also have, like, the big straw hats that you, like, mow in. Every time I see them, I feel like like you should be in a rice paddy picking rice or something, but those are cool, too. I think even underneath, they have the American flag on the bottom of them. It's really cool. So go to Oki, uh, the Oki brand on Instagram hit their link, go to their store, fill up your cart full of badass hats, and then as you check out, do not forget me on the promo code, the discount code, put in Cardigan Cowboy, all lowercase, all one word. Cardigan Cowboy, all lowercase, all one word. Again, Cardigan Cowboy. Put it in the promo code, 15%. Bam, knocked right off, dude. I'm telling you, it's awesome. They support me. We support them. You will get a great hat. It works. And the, the 15% is just that added like razzle dazzle, you know, hit them with that razzle dazzle, get you out of that pretty much without taxes. And if you pick the right shipping, I think it's pretty much free shipping, no taxes, you get a cool hat. Something I want to mention about this company though, they are not just hats, they support local artists. It Just recently they supported, they they launched a uh, a, a album with Tret Charles, Tret Charles is the album. They did the concert to launch his album for him. They totally support local artists. They support people coming up and trying to chase a dream. And none it's me. They're supporting me and they're supporting this podcast. And they're so cool, so awesome. So go get your cap at Oki. Go get you a cowboy hat at Shorty's. Go get you some land at Midwest Land Group and at all of them. Let them know if the Cardigan Cowboys sent you. They'll treat you top notch so you guys made it oh, we're at the end yes got through the sponsors now it's on to the episode this episode should be launching around father's day therefore it was a must that i got my dad on here he is the first episode and i hope you guys just love his vibe he's so positive he's an awesome father and he went through some he went through some stuff growing up. I mean, he almost died from a brain surgery uh, at the age of 15. He aspired to be a professional bull rider. It took all that way. He could no longer ride bulls. He is a phenomenal business owner. He's a phenomenal husband. He's a phenomenal dad. And he brought so much to this interview. And I couldn't think of any better way than to start it off with the man that has guided me through life. And he's the first cowboy I ever met. <laughs> So I hope you guys enjoy it. Thank you for listening. Oh my gosh. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And please, if you need a cowboy hat, a cap, or some land, go out, help out these sponsors that are sponsoring this show and supporting me doing what we do. And if you find value in this show, please share it. Please tell people about it. Write us. Let us know what you think. If all this just changes one life, it is totally worth it. And just know that you are loved, you're appreciated, look good, feel good, do good. Thank you. On to the show. 
Here's Bart Hayes, my dad. Thank you. praise you and glorify you and we just ask that you bless the cardigan cowboy and all of the conversations that taos will be listening to and people uh we just pray that the people listening get influenced and direction and uh, we just ask for your blessings lord through jesus christ i pray amen amen well well dad Welcome to the Cardigan Cowboy Podcast. You've made it, man. <laughs> well, thank you, son. I, uh, to be real honest with you, I'm pretty new to this podcast yep. world, and uh, uh, so yeah, here I am. Pretty new, and uh, I love it. One thing that's really cool is podcasts allow us just to have free form conversations. So yeah. act like the mics aren't here. We right. got the fire. Yeah, we've got whiskey. We've got cigars. We're in a good place, so and we're not in a rush. We're not in a rush at all. Because I, I need to share with your listeners that that I only have two versions of stories. I got the long version and the longer. Version. <laughs> so, so, so. We got all the time in the world. But before we get off in, before we get off into this interview, something I have here is. We are launching this, Dad, on Father's Day or around Father's Day. So it's going to yes. be really cool. So my gift to you is I'd like to do a little tribute. And I, I wrote down some things that I just wanted to say thank you for. But they were things that, that in a way, I was thankful for once I got older. And maybe I took uh-huh. for granted a little yeah. bit. So yeah. um, so hold tight real quick. I'll I'll run the, through these things. And uh, then we'll get, we'll get heavy and hot and heavy into... Uh, Get okay. dig, dig deep into what makes you, you. Okay. So, uh, first off, I want to thank you for letting horses be our babysitters. <laughs> Growing up, I tell you, we we grew up on forty beautiful acres. You always yeah. provided horses, and we were horseback more than we were on foot most that's, of the time. That's true, and uh, that was really cool. Yeah. Also, um, I feel like we just for for comedy relief here. I also got to mention that that. Uh, Mom and dad always, they, they never allowed us to just go unsupervised. So mm-hmm. we always, during the summer, we always had to be supervised. And uh, they would always pick a, a very beautiful high school girl to run us around, take <laughs> us to the pool. And I want to go ahead and say you had a little bit to do with that, maybe. So thank you for that. Um, You're welcome. <laughs> um, uh, I, the other thing that I really find very valuable as I've gotten older and something that I admire about you that I, I really took for granted is you allowed our uncles to be our heroes. Mm-hmm. And that was really cool because there's a lot of dads probably that are very, aren't humble enough to allow that. And I think you were very intelligent by realizing that it takes a community to, to raise good men. And you allowed, you allowed people into our lives and uh, love that. So... Mm-hmm. You always preached positivity is harder than negativity. Positivity is always harder. And, and I love that because you are always such a positive person. In fact, every time I, I run into people that know you, they're like, man, your dad's so positive. And therefore, you make it look really easy. But growing up with you, I, I got to see that it's not. And, and you make a daily choice to be positive, right. not negative. And <laughs> you didn't allow anything else but positivity <laughs> So at most times. So uh, we got a lot of them like, we're going to be happy today to talk. Right. So <laughs> that's right. <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you for that. Um, one thing that's really cool, and I think the world, yeah, this, this whole deal might be a total flop, but, and we might have only three listeners. And if you are those three listeners, we love you that's and thank right. you for listening. That's right. And if we impact one life, this whole thing has been totally worth it. Uh, and I'm so glad to be here. But one thing that I think if I could have anybody take away from this that I think is really cool is you were a wonderful father to me and my brother, but also you, you played a, a big role in, in your nieces and nephews and you took them on as if they were your own in a way and and not saying by no means they didn't have good parents they have mm-hmm. phenomenal parents aunts yeah. and uncles are badass man uh-huh. nothing like that but you did some really cool things and one thing that i really think is cool as i've gotten older is all our nieces on their birthday you would send flowers to the high school mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah 
I think that is just too crazy and too, uh, uh, this is very thoughtful. And uh, I reassure you that our nieces, as they, they looked for that special somebody to spend the rest of their life with, I truly believe that they, they looked for somebody that embodied what you had. So yeah. I think that's really cool. And, well, thank uh, you. I appreciate that. Okay, so on top of that, Dad, and I'll, I'll wrap this up real quick, but I, another thank you, and, and this is huge, and I think other dads, and I look forward to being in this role, but you always chose to ga- give your time and never money. And that was something that I did have a hard time with growing up at times because you're a successful man, and, and money was ample in a lot of ways. I had many, I'm, I'm ashamed to say, I, you're the one I called and I had tears in my eyes, whether I had a heartbreak or stubbed my toe or you know, getting mistreated on a job or whatever. And I always admire now that, that I'm older, that you never, you never threw money at a problem. You never, you never said, Hey, like you always remind me that, that I'm never alone and you're always there. And, but those are my fights that I'm going to have to fight in those battles, but you're there for me. And I think that's something that, that speaks volumes. And as I've gotten older, I really appreciate that that even whenever you you had the total capability of easing things over with money, you chose to just be there and show up. And uh, I love that. I love that. And uh, something funny, uh, the other day we were, I was with a group of friends and they were talking about, um, they were talking about worst fears and we got to talking and uh, all the normal ones like death by fire, <laughs> dying in a porter potty. You know, oh, that's, stumbling. That's bad. Dude, that's real bad. But uh, you know, after I really thought about that, my my biggest fear is having to conquer my fears without the guidance of of my father. And mm-hmm. yeah. I really appreciate that. And you're a phenomenal man. And I just I rave about you. And I think the world should know that. Man, happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to all those dads out there. And uh, yeah. Thanks for being you. Well, Thanks that, for having me. That's, so. awesome. that's awesome. <laughs> well, thank you, son. And yep. One thing that uh, uh, your listeners will get to know more about you, but your gifts are always awesome gifts, and what you just gave me is maybe the top of that's the cool. top. So well, thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Well, I one thing I wanted to do, Dad, was I kind of wanted to start from the beginning, and, and a lot of people don't know this about you, but you you were very close to death. At, at, a, at a very young age, at 15 years old, mm-hmm. you had a, you had a, a brain aneurysm. Is that correct? That's and it, it took over you and changed your life pretty quick. And if, if I'm not yeah. mistaken, it was one of those deals like everybody kind of said their piece and was ready for, for you to not mm-hmm. be here yeah. anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can you to... dive into any of those details or how it? Oh, I'd, I'd love to, I'd, I'd love to tell that story and, and, uh, uh, and then we'll just we'll just go yeah. from there. Yeah, it's all free but, flow. But uh, I I can't help but for me to be able to tell that story though I kind of have to tell you a little bit of things that would led up to that if that's cool. Yeah. And uh, one thing is 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 uh, I was at a church revival. I was about twelve years old and I accepted mm-hmm. Jesus as my personal savior. And at that time I had no idea what was getting ready to happen yeah. in my life. Uh, because at that time, uh, I was on top of the world, came from a small town in southwest Kansas. I rode my horse every day. Uh, by that time, I had already got on a couple of bulls that had been to the national finals rodeo. Mm-hmm. And and I'd found out that at a very young age that, that I got a lot of recognition from my brother's whenever I rode bulls because it was something that just (laughs) natural to me. So they was always a lot more athletic than I. And, and, uh, so when, when I started getting that recognition of doing something, I would just wanted more of that. Yeah. And so, um, at, at, uh, at 14 years old, I, uh, I was riding big bulls and, came football season, I wanted to play football, you know. So I was a freshman in high school. Uh, October was – I turned 15 in October that year. And my older brother Brad had – he was the star football player that year. He was a senior. Mm-hmm. And 
a saddle bronc horse had bucked him off over the horse's head and stepped on his arm, put a couple plates and the screws in his arm, and yeah. the horse took him out of out of the football season. And I got to tell you, Rolla, Kansas, I, I tell everybody that I was almost in the top ten in my class. Uh, I usually don't let everybody know there was only 11 of us <laughs> in that class. But you almost made it, though. I almost made it. So close. I was, I was almost there. So it's a real small town. Yeah. And um, so the chances of me playing were getting larger when Brad <laughs> got hurt. But, but uh, then the other superstar, his name was Greg Reed, and he broke his big toe in uh, one of them early games. Uh-huh. And so, here again, they still didn't put me in. Uh, and <laughs> and uh, finally, we was, uh, we, was, we was playing Hanston, and I kept saying, Coach, put me in. One thing I, I've never been short of is confidence, you know. <laughs> and uh, I was like, Coach, put me in, man. I know. And he was like, Hayes, you need to grow like 20 pounds. You're just way too small. And uh, so I was like, man, I know I can do it. And, yeah. And, uh, well, he finally puts me in on, on, the, the, foot, on the, uh, the kickoff team. And... There was a, a star running back that went on to K-State uh, from this town called Hanston, Kansas. Yeah. And I made all four tackles on him in that. So the next game, this is winding up the season. This is how far the season had went into. It's the last game of the season. He says, Hayes, you're the starting middle linebacker. I was like, all right, I'm in. And uh, we was playing – Ensign at Ensign, and uh, it was brutal. Like the 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 backfield averaged two hundred pounds, and I was only like, well, when I graduated three years after that, I was only one hundred and forty pounds. So I was like one hundred and nineteen pounds. Mm-hmm. And uh, anyway, I led the team in tackles and that's and cool. Had four sacks. I did and, not know that. And uh, we uh, we won the football game. <laughs> and there's there's two things that I'll I'll never forget. One, the chick that I had the hots for never told me good game. Oh, it just mm. devastated me. Dude, you know? that and, total bitch. Dude, where, where, what is what is no? We need to shout out. Where is she at today? No, well, she's very successful without me. <laughs> <laughs> Good for her. It wasn't but, all you, huh? <laughs> no. Dang it. And uh, then it when uh, that happens. the other thing is, is I was walking off the field. My coach, Mr. Jackson, I love him dearly. Uh, he's up in age, and I swear can still outrun us, still beat yeah. us in basketball, can still – he's. I'm sure he's in his 80s. And I'm, I'm telling you, the man is as fit and, and healthy as can be still to this day. So – but Mr. Jackson was coming, was walking off the field, and he said, "Bart, next year you are going to tear him up." <laughs> and 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 I was like, "Dude, I can't oh, wait." It feels good. I can't wait. You know, I my coach was was proud of me, and yep. I was proud of that. Yeah. Anyway, man, that next day, um, I, we grew up hunting. My my cousin Greg is a is one of my heroes in life, and Somebody, him and I grew up close together, and uh, his dad was a successful rancher, and mm-hmm. and so Greg is is running that ranch now. But Uncle Ole, um, uh, we go and we would hunt quail. Yeah. So Ensign's not very far from there, and that was kind of our thing on Saturday after football games. We would always go hunt quail, and so it's Saturday morning, and we stayed at Grandma Oni's house, and. And uh, we get up and we're hunting and we hunted a lot. Like we just had we just had guns with us all the time. Like like even the activity route bus, you still got to take your guns and go hunt after practice and stuff no on, on on school activity stuff. You what know? a cool time! <laughs> I mean, <laughs> how crazy so, is that? So to think about that now would be like man on the way home of of. Giving everybody rides back home after practice, we hunted pheasant. So wow. So, uh, them days are are Long for sure gone. gone. And uh, wow. So 
the uh, uh, we're hunting, and I can just remember talking to Dad and saying, Dad, what's so weird is I'm not hitting any birds. Like, it's odd. The gun's not coming up to my shoulder. I'm not, I'm not feeling it. And he said, well, son, you just, man, you got your bell rung last night. One time I, I went to the wrong huddle. One time I, uh, I started. You went to the wrong huddle? Went to the wrong huddle. I went to their huddle instead of ours. <laughs> did you come back with their play at least? <laughs> we did make a sack that next year. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. But uh, one time I they, they got me before I got over there, but I was going to the wrong side of the field and Anyway, I wow, you got we definitely had my bell rung a few yeah. times. So, um, anyway, he said, "You know, you'll you'll be okay. Just keep on keeping on." And and uh, we went and we hunted the rest of the day. And I don't think I got a bird all day, which uh, uh, I still had to clean them all, just so everybody <laughs> knows that I didn't get any of them, but I still had to clean them. But, but <laughs> So, oh man! Uh, Hate when that happens. So God. the next morning, I get up and we're around Grandma's table and eating cereal for breakfast. And whenever I take the spoon, I might hit my chin or I might hit my forehead or it might hit my cheek. And so we all and I'm just laughing at myself, going because I'm in no pain at all. I'm like. I can't get the spoon to hit my mouth. And like, I was just, and we just laughed it off, you know, and Brad says, Hey, let's get the guns. And out the back door we went. And, and so then I was, I was walking and I was starting to trip and fall a lot. And, and uh, but still I had no pain. And we, uh, this was a Sunday. And so we was headed home mid afternoon and, and, uh, we were in the the vehicle and riding back. Mr. Reed is in there, too, uh, and Dad. And a pheasant comes across the road, and Dad said, Hey, son, there's a, there's a pheasant. Let's go get him. And, yeah. And I was like, Dad, I, I'm sick. I, I don't feel good. And uh, for me not to jump out of that vehicle and, and uh, chase that pheasant down was just something we would not miss, you yeah. know. Yeah. Anyway, so I get home, and, and uh, the next day's Monday, and uh, I told Brad, I, I told my brother, I said, well, just tell Mom and Dad I'm, I'm going to stay in bed today. I'm not feeling good. And I stayed down in the basement for quite a few days. I, I don't know how many days of mm. just just uh, real sick. And, and so, Mom, they take us over to the local hospital, Dr. Perito at Elkhart, and Dr. Perito was on vacation, and so there's another doctor there, and they just kind of give me an IV and prop me up and, you know, just mm. thinking. I just had my bell rung, so yeah. Um, we, I'm in there for a few days, and I'm like, hey, basketball season is starting. I, I need to get home for tryouts, and I would figured out that if I – if I took the, the hospital bed and I raised it up to about a 45 degree angle and I laid on my left side that I felt fine. There was no problems whatsoever. And so as long as I stayed in that position, I was good. And that doctor, he would come in. I go, man, I'm feeling great. I'm feeling great. And convinced them that I was okay. And they let me out, and I can't walk. Man, I fall as soon as I get out of the out, and they bring a wheelchair in, and oh. they get me, and uh, I, I get to the gym where they're having tryouts, and I, I get my shorts on, and, and I'm running out there, and, man, I fall. and, and uh, I didn't know any of that. I, I did not know that you actually tried to try out for basketball even yeah. after. Yeah, so, so mom just comes – running in the gym just crying and and she says you've got a brain tumor really <laughs> I'm like, mom, whoa. whoa mom whoa, whoa mom hey yeah. no no and she says no the doctor just called that they're sending you to a neurosurgeon there's something really wrong uh with you i was like 
well, hey, just just breathe. We'll be okay. And and uh, so they took me to Amarillo, Texas, and um, mom and dad they they was willing to take me to New York or mm-hmm. wherever. And uh, Doctor Preto recommended Doctor Price in Am- in Amarillo, Texas. It was the very first, like it was in it was December second, nineteen seventy seven. So the CAT scan was just uh, just one. It was just a head CAT scan, like you you. It wasn't a body thing. They just stuck you in this this tunnel looking thing, and I'll never forget the sound of that machine it made. But I was in there for like I don't know six hours or something on a flat stainless steel bed they had me strapped down where i where i wouldn't move mm. and that camera just would go yee, yee. <laughs> i'll never forget oh, that dear. and uh that, that's how i felt on my flight to thailand <laughs> i felt like i was on a <laughs> table with a annoying sound i couldn't imagine so uh yeah, and uh, uh, it came back on on uh, one one picture, one picture in that CAT scan, and it was about the size of a pen uh, of a ballpoint pen. And the reason what had happened is I had a weak blood vein that I was born with, but a cyst had been grown around that, uh, uh, and so whenever the vein ruptured the blood blood stayed inside of this cyst instead of going throughout that brain or it would have killed me wow and dr price just said hey god god didn't want you to die yet and uh uh, he's got big plans for you and so after you and oldest hayden was born i thought oh gosh i hope god has something else for you (laughs) (laughs) well yeah i'm so glad you made it through that whole deal Made it through and yeah. lived to tell the story. Never so got cool. to ride bulls again. Never got to play football again. But but uh, it all worked out. That's awesome, Dad. So well, you had issues with your right side. You lost feeling on your right lost side. Lost coordination. Uh, lost all the coordination in my right. Yeah. My, my right hand. My right foot. Uh, and to everybody that can hear the jingle, maybe not watching, the dad's got his spurs on. Well, I should have. Me and the grandkids were riding horses today. So. <laughs> so. Oh God! Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. The, you lost, and you didn't even go to any rehab or any. any well, you know, back in the seventies, I I don't. Uh, surely not in that part of the world uh, was there anything like that. Yeah. It was like, quit your whining, uh, get up and find somebody else to help. Yeah. And, and all your problems will go away. And so it didn't take me long before uh, the people at at the hospital picked up on how motivated I was mm-hmm. and, and how positive I was. And, and so it wasn't long that that uh, um, really after Brinkshire, I got where I could ride wheelies on the wheelchair pretty good <laughs> and down the hallways, and they was like, Dude, you just had brain surgery. Like, you cannot be riding wheelers in this wheelchair. And uh, um, so, anyway, but they started me going and talking to other kids and their families that were going through trauma. Yeah. And I tell everybody, if you really want to uh, to get right and understand a few things, you just need to go to the uh, pediatric ward at your local hospital and you need to sit down and visit with some parents when their children has leukemia or yeah. something, and uh, your your perspective of life will will get changed. Yeah, for sure. So. And you always preach that growing up too to serve others. Do you ever yeah. feel you don't? I don't know. It yeah. does have a way of fixing things if if you're down and out and and help others and and do what you can and mm-hmm. hard work. I believe in hard work, and and you're not going to ha- work hard without serving other people. Like somewhere, somehow, uh, you're influencing somebody's life when when you work hard. So. And if you do it right, in a way, you you come away with more than what you you oh, absolutely you gave in absolutely. a way. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I've I've always felt like that. Like yeah. I'm, um, but yeah. yeah. If you truly give from a selfless mm-hmm. heart, it seems like it benefits you right. just as much as it does them. Right. I I believe that. Yeah. Too. So, uh, but yeah, uh, it was, it was quite a, uh, it was quite an event and, and it's like so many other 
time, son, is you go through the storm and you make that, and that makes you a stronger person. And then you look back on that and you go, you know, I'm so fortunate that I went through that. You know, at the yeah. time it's happening, it's devastating. It uh, it changed everything that how I, I truly believed that I was going to be a world champion bull rider. And and I I started at a very young age to accomplish that. And I had a lot of that going my way. And then you take something like this happens, it takes your dream away. Well, the hardest thing to hold on to is a dream. I promise you. And um, at, at that age, I didn't know what to do with myself without that dream. And uh, there was... There was some redirection in my life, and uh, I'll, I'll go right into another one because it was on a cold winter day, and I was looking outside this big picture window with, with your Grammy Lila, which is my mom. Mom and I was sitting there and, and uh, watching the snow fall, and I just looked at Mom and said, Mom, someday I'm going to own a company called LBN. Now, I didn't know it was going to be a construction company like it came out to be, but... <laughs> but uh, I just said, Mom, gonna I'm going to own a company someday called LBN. Well, that became my dream. It became my dream. The people that influenced me were cowboys, people like my Uncle Ole, my, uh, my Uncle Don, my Uncle Ron, Bill Light, my dad. These were all guys that wasn't scared to wear a cowboy hat, that were business. Um, um, they were leaders. They, were, uh, they became the people that I wanted to be. And and uh, I have some cousins that are successful business people, and I, I just looked at that, and my dream through that process of my high school years became I'm not to be a world champion bull rider, but for me to be a successful businessman. And I've spent most of my adult life trying to achieve that, mm -hmm. and and uh, but that became my dream at that point so that, uh, you you nailed something interesting you were surrounded by men that were not scared to put on a cowboy hat that's right so in my day and the people that i wanted to associate with the cowboy hat was what was the common theme they was they my dad was a football coach and would wear a cowboy hat many times now my dad wasn't the he he hadn't rode horses much he grew up more of a of a sports um, man, being very athletic. My mom uh, grew up in a, on a ranch life. And so dad incorporated that hat after he had met mom. But the people that I was around on a regular basis, like my Uncle Ole, my Uncle Don, um, uh, Bill Light, these were people that had hats on. Then whenever I, I started... Uh, being a cow uh, riding bulls, Larry Mahan was my hero. Like, we rode on the top of our horse barn rodeo number one sport because we just knew Larry Mahan would fly over in his plane headed to Cheyenne and, <laughs> and, and read that, you know. And, uh, uh, That's but, awesome. But these, these guys, they, uh, I, I associated the cowboy hat with, with success mm -hmm. and, uh, I've I've wore a cowboy hat my entire life, and in fact, this hat right here is um, one of my life goals. I wanted to have a hat made, and so a friend of mine from Bristow, Bill Henshaw, was he had found an old hat of his dad's, and he was going to go over there and and have them rebuild this hat. And I said, "Well, Bill, I just want to jump in with you and go over there." And man, I got to to looking, and I, I I was like, man, you guys could make my own hat for me, and it was uh, over at Oklahoma City in the stockyard shorties, yep. and dude, they made me a hat, and and uh, it's been a that was a a huge goal that I had for many years. To That's so cool. Have my own hat. Well, I I love shorties because of that hat, and I went and got my own here. And while I was there, I hit Shorty up. She's a wonderful lady who owns that company. She's the first woman to 
own a hat, a cowboy hat company uh-huh. and the battles that she went through just to get these awesome hats on the market is a wonderful story. And I, I think they approach it in a way like she's all about quality, uh-huh. like the price will handle itself. Yeah. And yeah. she does such a cool, she has such a cool story. I hope to have her on this podcast and, well. and she supports shorty, uh, cowboy hattery supports this podcast and, and we will be, uh, we are affiliated with them and they do have a pr- phenomenal product, but it's really cool that we, um, Cardigan Cowboy approached them because they're good at what they do. They didn't approach us because they wanted advertising. I like it. I just walked in and asked, uh, honestly, I just walked in and asked where the owner was. And they said that, um, you know, I'll have to come back or whatever. I said, well, what's, what's his name? They're like, well... It's a her. <laughs> and then uh, they said her name's Shorty, and I felt totally dumb. But I was like, wow, I did not, I didn't know that. Uh, and they actually made, gave me a meeting with her, and I sat down, and like an hour later, I mean, this woman is, is so cool. I think she's nearing her 80s. Uh, she's in her 70s, I believe. Wow. And when you talk to her, you can just feel the wisdom. You can feel the experience, and, and you can feel the love that she has for not only the hats, but just that lifestyle, that lifestyle and that culture. And she grew up, she's telling me that she grew up, her he, her heroes were cowboys. That's all uh-huh. she ever wanted to be. Mm-hmm. And as she went through the pro, I believe she rode bulls, man. Like she was wow. a roughie. Wow. And whenever she's going to these rodeos, there was nobody to shape a hat. Nobody. So she would go to these rodeos with a kettle and, and just steam what come out of cool. a kettle and she would shape hats. And, and, uh, out of that, and Shorty, I'm really sorry. I'm busting your story here, and I will have her on the podcast. But one thing that was really cool, she saw a need in the market because her father had old hats, like Bill Henshaw mm. that you were saying. She took it to somebody, and they ruined them. Oh, wow. And, and they were her father's hats. And I, I'll have to ask Shorty if I know uh, her father passed when she was quite young, and it was a devastating deal. And, and to lose those hats was a big deal. Well, you know, somebody just mentioned, like, there's a market for that. Mm-hmm. And here we are, man. She has... She has the best hats on the market. And I'm not saying that because we're affiliated with them. Just go in there. And what I love about them too is they'll make it right. Like that, like they let money handle itself. Like in the end, like they make it right. I've went in there actually. I have a gray one that they shaped, did it all up, and I, I thought the brim was a little too too much. And they cut it down. How cool. Is and that? uh they they handled it. They're absolutely phenomenal. So there you go, Shorty. There's your spoof. I, I promise. Well, well guys, she. But- uh, uh, it was a, a a big goal that I had, and I had the dream that someday I would have my own hat that mm-hmm. I felt was my hat. You know, get that. Uh, get that hundred X Beaver. I'm telling you, man. You want my name it. in it? No. <laughs> 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 That's awesome. Well, we love shorties, and and, uh, and I just. I love that hat. Yeah. So yeah, it's a it's a classic. Good. Good. So, yeah. So um, anyway, yeah. I, this whole I like your setup here, son. I, I'm. Yeah. I guess I can just drink up, it. man. Okay. Enjoy it. Uh, we can light a cigar here. Nice. Yeah. Whenever I was inspired by Joe Rogan, he he's I love his podcast, and then I just got really addicted to podcasts. And, but there was. We lack something with that Western culture, kind of that you know. We couldn't. I couldn't really ever find anything that really, really found that. And I was born with the gift of gab. I thought, why not give it a shot? Yeah. Well, so. I want to. I want to share with your listeners a little bit more about that, because you say that you was born with the gift of gab, but what you was really born with is you're a wonderful listener, son. You oh, you. you are a very good listener, and uh, I think that is one of your your greatest talents thank it's you just the ability and and you have some of these characteristics from your grandpa my dad what you call papa neil and dad was a very successful uh he was a very successful athlete very talented and uh he went on to to be a wonderful leader in this USD 217, that's Rolla, Kansas. Uh, Dad was involved in that school system like 34 years. He was the principal and the superintendent. Some years he was the 
principal and the superintendent. Both I didn't of know them. that. And uh, he, uh, many times he coached. Uh, but I know one thing that, that dad, um, there was only, in, in them 34 years that dad was involved, or 33, I could be wrong on that, anybody really wanting to fact check me here, but um, uh, he only had two students drop out. Two students dropped out. And one um, gentleman, and I never knew this because dad never really talked about himself a lot, uh, but um, a gentleman at dad's funeral came up to me and says, I want to tell you a story about your dad. And we was like, okay, all right, tell us. And, and uh, he said, I was going to quit high school my senior year. And I had left school, and I was out on the tractor, and here comes your dad. Drove right through the field right to the front of the tractor. I was not driving it any farther. Your dad j jumped out, told me I was not quitting school, to get in the car, and he was taking me back. And he took him back. The man went on to have multiple degrees, uh, uh, engineering degrees, and uh, became a very successful man. But that was the kind of... Uh, That's cool. Dad. But he went 10 years without getting rid of a teacher a 10-year streak no teachers changed so that's unbelievable this is this is the kind of leadership my dad gave but i've asked i ask people a lot of times one of my favorite questions to ask people is can you tell me who your second grade school teacher was can you tell me who your first grade school teacher can you tell me your fourth grade how about your sixth grade who was your business teacher who I can tell you every teacher, uh, and m the majority of them taught all five of us kids at, at Rolla. Wow. So uh, it's a uh, – but a lot of times you'd see my dad, um, he would – early in the morning he would be – he was the one in charge of the school buses. So his day started at 5.30 in the morning communicating with the school bus drivers. And – and a little insight, that's where we always knew where the good birds were at because of the school bus. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah they they were, had an eye on they, the pheasant. They were the scouts. <laughs> and so, so, knew where them so, hot corners so we, were. We knew where, they, uh, uh, we knew where they was at. Well, and then uh, you would see Dad out on the playground. Dad always said that it's in the elementary school uh, grades that you're going to make the hugest influence on these kids mm -hmm. and you would always see dad out on the playground you would see him sitting on steps with the janitors talking and visiting yeah uh you would see him in the in having meetings with the teachers and then some days them school board meetings would go late into the night but that was the kind of leader dad was he was involved with everybody there well uh as as time went on and he and it came time for him to retire he felt so strong that he he quit and then he became a superintendent at another school district uh west king kansas for four years that was about three hours away just to give the new superintendent a good chance that everybody wouldn't come to dad uh and, and they would give the new guy I'm that's like, great dude i mean what kind of man does that, you know? <laughs> That's awesome. So, anyway, Dad was a, a big influence, yep. but he listened to people. One of the greatest compliments that people give me, no matter how busy Dad was, he always he listened. He always listened. He always would look you in the eye and actually listen, not be trying to figure out what he was going to yeah. say next or how he was going to up you one or yeah. whatever. Man, he just listened to you. And yeah. No, he... He's definitely instilled a lot. He was a patient man, too. Mm -hmm. He's patient. And one of my favorite things about Papa Neil was he would always say, this is how humble he was. It, people would come to him for information, and, and, and he was always handling that. And I remember him just going, look, if you really want to know what's going on, you always talk to the janitor. You always be friends with the janitor. And, and that was something he instilled in us, that you're never too good to talk too good to talk to anybody. That's right. And... and uh he truly believed that 
that the janitor played just as big of a role in his school system as anybody. And yeah. it was really interesting to look back on because that's where you'd see Pop. He would, Pop Neal would be hanging out with the janitors. He'd be hanging out with the teachers, with the kids. He just he took the time to really sit down and and because of that, he really knew what was going on. Yeah. And and uh, I want to I tell this that. story too, too, because he was a wonderful basketball player. Like Dad, he was a great basketball player. So my uh, at Rolla. Every couple of years, they would have the, the whole school reunion. Instead of a class reunion, you got the whole school. Mm-hmm. So uh, I had graduated high school. I believe it was the first uh, reunion uh, after I graduated high school. I go back, you know, and the odd years are taking on the even years in a, in a basketball game. And at halftime, they was going to give a silver dollar away to whoever made it from half court. So... We all line up on half court. We go. Everybody shoots. Nobody makes it. We all go through it again. Nobody makes it. And the announcer, whoever was on the microphone, said, "Mr. Hayes, will you come out here and show us how to make a shot from free throw or from half court?" So Dad comes out and he's in a suit and dress shoes and and uh, from half court just pops it, man, bottom of the net. And everybody's going, oh, that's he was so lucky, and and they gave him the ball again, and he and he he made it again, <laughs> dude. But one time when I was a kid was just playing, I saw Dad shoot ten out of ten shots from half court and make it. But, Unbelievable. But uh, he was a phenomenal athlete, baseball player, uh, football player, and basketball player. But, that's cool. Oh, so, Papa Neil. Yeah. I asked him one time. I said, "Dad, because he was he was uh, recruited uh, by the Angels, and in baseball." I said, "Dad, why didn't you play f- professional baseball?" And he said, "Well, son, you make the choice. You want to ride on a bus with a bunch of hairy legged guys and play double and triple headers, or you want to hang out with your mom." <laughs> I was like, good choice, Dad. Good choice. I get it. I get it. <laughs> he was a smart man. <laughs> smart man. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. So. Papa Neil, uh, man, what a great example of, of a good marriage, too. Grammy Lila and Papa Neil had a wonderful marriage. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, I, I I think about them often and, and how they they worked well together and uh, – I don't know. In in some way, Grammy Lila was never held back by a man. Like she did her thing, no, and my Papa Neil no. loved every minute of it. And my I think mom, it's uh, Grammy Lila, she worked all the years while she was raising us. She was a uh, she was my seventh grade home teacher, uh, oh, and kind of tough to be the t- teacher's pet on that well, one. Well, you huh? know that's an interesting story in itself. Like I have a lot of people ask me, "Well, did you call her?" Mrs. Hayes, or did you call her mom? I thought, I always called her mom. Yeah. <laughs> Why would I call her? I didn't even know her name was Lila till I was in eighth grade. <laughs> <laughs> Mama? Uh, yeah. And I always felt the opposite, to be honest with you, because dad was the superintendent and mom was a school teacher. Mm-hmm. And uh, I always felt like other people was out to prove to me that I wasn't going to be treated special Mm -hmm. because of my parents you know like i always felt like i had to do everything a lot a lot a lot more yeah to get any justification out of it to be honest but the man that really had a lot of influence on me i had many people but my industrial arts teacher mr leonard really um had a huge influence on me on on how to how to be able to take a piece of paper and kind of sketch out what you want mm-hmm. and kind of draft it out and then how to read that tape measure and read that level and then handle all the saws uh, to deal with wood. And so I really came up through the industrial arts side yeah, and uh, got, to, got to be um, the foundation of what I've made my living out of so did not make that (laughs) (laughs) no that's cool so i I feel like that's something we need more in school or them 
them them type of classes. Well, I honestly too like I went out dancing last night, Dad, and I know that's not even good to say here in Oklahoma. We don't we don't know the Corona, what I a, guess. But it was Saturday night. Though. It was Saturday night. Doesn't Corona take the weekend off? Yeah, and it does. Yeah, and so, come to find out, <laughs> if you two step well enough, it don't even it affect. You. Up, it don't huh? catch up. <laughs> but uh, some of y'all here in Tulsa need. Yep, we need some dancing classes in high school because, bless your hearts. Um, yeah, I was very fortunate growing up because you, you're you're a phenomenal two stepper and, and mom was too, and so I always had really good teachers, but. I, I've heard of small schools. Uh, I talked to a buddy that dances like a, a bad mama jamma, and that was his – to get out of ag, you had to know how to dance, man, to graduate ag class in his school. And uh, I, anyway, just being out and about last night, I saw that some of y'all were in chemistry or something because <laughs> it wasn't – Two stepping and, and two stepping in ag class. Let me tell you that. Uh, uh, well, let me tell you what. What um, I was real fortunate to have a my older brother Brad, real good looking. Guy. <laughs> anyway, he has this young. Dude, I love the older brother, like because that's what Chance was for me, yeah, right? He yeah, was the, yeah, yeah. I feel you yeah. on that. So anyway, this chick had the hots for Brad, and she was very pretty. And, uh-huh. But she was a dance instructor. Well, she would come to spend time with Brad, and Brad being Brad, he wasn't going to spend much time with anybody at all. <laughs> she would spend her evenings mostly teaching me how to dance uh, there at the house, and that really paid off for me. Did it? Yeah. I, I love dancing to this day. I love the memories that I have with my mom dancing. Mm-hmm. Mom and I uh all through high school and stuff at the yep. prom dances and homecoming dances and stuff. Yep. Mom and I would dance, and that's probably one of my most favorite pictures I have of Mom and I dancing at a um, at my cousin Larry's, his daughter, Colby's wedding. Mm-hmm. And and uh, probably one of my most favorite memories of Mom is, cool. is dancing with her. Well, you're hitting on another good daddy deal right there, and you always, always – you were never too good to dance with your mama. That's and right. last night, actually, yeah, it was last night. Uh-huh. We went to one of the first live concerts. Finally, we got to go, oh, really? and I invited my mama. Well, good. And uh, um, and we were the first ones on the dance floor, nice. right? I got mama out there, and yeah, and, uh, yeah I good. love it. Good I love for it. You, and man. and it really made her evening, yeah, and it was a memory right. I always have. And that's right. And uh, yeah, I remember being a kid. And we, we came from humble beginnings because I remember we lived in a little home. They're outside of Manford, Oklahoma. Uh-huh. Yeah. And Mama, I was probably about in first, second grade. Mom was teaching us how to dance yeah. and That's do right. things. And, yeah. She taught us how to dance, and you taught us how to hold a door open That's by right. God. Yeah. That's right. So, Well, that just brings back a whole lot of things. Is, and uh, you had mentioned it earlier, but gratitude Gratitude. You know, and grateful. one of the biggest compliments I've had from so many people is whenever you all were kids, and even to this day, but but when you all was real young, we'd go into a convenience store or something, and uh, I'd get the drinks or whatever, mm-hmm. and you'd always say, you and, you and your brother, Olus Hayden, would both say, hey, thanks, Dad, or I appreciate that, Dad, or yeah. something like that. And them, them people, them clerks would just look at me and go, you, your kids tell you thank you. Yeah, I go, man. I guess it works out sometimes, mm-hmm. you know. But, but uh, ain't that cool? You know, it just is. gratitude, just being thankful, just being thankful and not scared to tell people thanks and yeah, and, hey, or I appreciate it, or or just a pat on the back. Yeah. So love that. Uh, that's something I've been real proud of you. Well, that is the Western culture that I'm trying to like through this show and bring and, and, and support. And that is, there is something about a young man or a young woman that's able to say, yes, sir, no, ma'am, have some manners, hold the door open, be great. It has got me so far in life. Yeah. And, and although as I've climbed this corporate ladder, it wasn't a resume. It wasn't anything. It was simply because I appreciated people and I wasn't scared to stand up for what was right. And I wasn't scared to also say thank you, mm-hmm. and that you're appreciated, and and 
crap. Uh, I remember one of the things that you did as a kid that was so great, and I, I encourage dads and moms to do is is you told me at a young age that nobody's too good to talk to you either. And and I remember multiple times, and I dreaded it, man, but you'd be like, hey, there's Billy. And Billy knows me, and you're going to go over there and say hi to Billy and tell him you're my son and, and things. And, oh, gosh, I'd be like, dude. <laughs> <sighs> and we'd do it. But through that, it taught me that there is nothing wrong. And I'm telling you, there is nothing wrong with going up and shaking somebody's hand just saying hi. Yeah. There's You don't have to have a reason. You don't have to have an agenda. You don't have to, the fact that they're in your area, there's nothing wrong with genuinely saying hello to somebody. And let me tell you, if they don't shake your hand, you didn't need to know them anyway. That's the way we feel right so, there. And uh, in, a, in a way that, that's what helped me out in my career. In fact, the, the position I have now is all because I I kept a good contact with one person through jobs and just always checked in and said hi and was grateful for that relationship and. You taught me to network. Yeah. So it's nice. Something else that you always do, Dad, is whenever somebody comes up and they have a problem, you always, the first words out of your mouth usually are, well, let's talk about it. Mm-hmm. And I think that's really cool because you let them talk and you ain't, you're not there to solve their problem. Mm-hmm. You're there to fill the problem with them, if that makes sense in a way. Mm-hmm. You, you're just there like, man, like, mm-hmm. dude, that. You're right. It's a tough spot, and it's tight. And sometimes just listening and letting somebody talk is is huge, life changing. Yeah, life changing. And I think whenever you talk about depression and anxiety and people know, I think it all comes from a point they feel alone and 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 they aren't looking for somebody to solve their problem overnight. They they just need a listening ear and somebody just go, "Wow, I feel you, and I'm in it too. I'm hurting too now." I, I feel you, and, and let's talk. Let's just and and although this is your battle to fight, mm-hmm. and I can't do anything, I'm still with you. Yeah, and and that's something you always did so well, and that's where I'm hoping this deal catches on, and and we can bring some really good conversations that just tell people they're listening that that life is good, it's going to get better. You're not alone, and people care. People care about you. Because that's what the cowboy is about, and that's what we have the grit, but yet we have the compassion. Mm-hmm. And and you always brought that compassion. You always, you never belittled somebody for being kind. You never said that that being thankful or grateful was made you less of a man. You know, mm-hmm. you always took time. And by God, um, I think I still got your initials branded on my ass from a from the concho on your yeah, belt yeah. a few times i didn't say yes ma'am or no sir or paid my respects or and and yeah. it's though it's things like that that i grew up going man like that's what you're going after that's yeah. what you were grateful men grateful well, people i'm i'm sure proud of you and thank you for saying all of that stuff and and uh but that's the way i believe and yeah uh, uh you know a lot of it is too um some just some old common sense stuff that dad used to tell me is is uh one time dad told me he said look son he said when people look at you they think you're stupid (laughs) when you when you talk they know you are so just keep your mouth shut yeah (laughs) you know well he wasn't actually saying that just about me he's saying that about everybody yep and if you will look at life at yourself and so whenever you you come up to problems if you just look at yourself first instead of trying to look at everybody else and trying to make it be other people's fault, you just look at yourself and start working on the problem yep. there. You usually find out that uh, it, it'll all work its yeah. way. Yeah, get small. Yeah, get small. Get small, right. get simple. And, and worry about yourself and, and get yourself in line. Yeah, get yourself in and line. And this world is full of people wanting to change the world, but nobody wants to change the gosh dang toilet paper. Yeah. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah. Just. Well, they don't want to change themselves, you know? <laughs> yeah. And, and. You're uh, right. But the, the fact of the matter is, is happiness and contentment really starts within. It really starts with you. Yep. Whenever it's just you and you alone and, and, uh, 
nobody else is gonna gonna make your dream. You know, it's uh, and it's real simple to f- get in that ditch, <laughs> get in that tunnel vision that it's mm-hmm. if somebody doesn't do something for me, I can never reach my dream. Yep. Well, when you start looking at yourself as the problem and you start looking at yourself to be the solution to that problem, you find out that other people are more than happy to give you all the time and attention and things that you need to do that. Um, and I've always said your sister or my sister, your aunt Becky told me one time that really if, if uh, money is the solution to the problem, the money's not really the problem. Um, that that's such a true statement. Whenever you really talk to people that have problems, it's normally money's not the solution to that. Uh, hard work, um, having a dream, and realizing that the healing process, no matter if it's emotional, uh, if it's physical, it's a long time. So whatever that that process is for you to heal up whether you go bankrupt whether you lose your dream whether you lose your your family or you lose that that loss of whatever it is that you lose that is creating this problem that healing process is not a fast process it's not something that you can just put money in the checking account and all of it goes away you know and so I think that whenever you start listening to people uh, and and visiting with them, that that they talk, they they will they come around to that themselves. They just need somebody to listen to. And one of the things that Dad always told me is, "Son, God gave you two ears and one mouth for a reason. He expects you to listen twice as much as you talk. And so be willing to listen. Get out there and and and." Be slow to react, but but quick to listen. That was something else that popped. He never he never reacted out of emotion. Watching right. him, he always mm-hmm. he was always real. He was the coolest cucumber in the kitchen yeah. when things got hot. Yeah. yeah, and I like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, another thing, back on Dad, real quick, because he went on to uh, form. Uh, it was named after Dad. It was the Hayes Hayes Educational Center. And in Rolla, Kansas, it was one of the first little communities in the state of Kansas that you could get a college education in a town of 250 people if all the cats and dogs were home. But could sit right there and get a college education from OSU and and uh, and a little town in Kansas. Wow. Pretty amazing. But Dad... Hmm. Uh, he was also known to put down a Coca Cola and a. He was not scared of a Coke. That's right. Or I, I, I did have the privilege of growing up the, the dad that was not scared to look over at you while we was driving down the road and say, "Son, I feel like we need to stop and get us a Coke." And yeah, dude. Like we never complained. Like, can yeah. we stop? Yeah, like, it dude, was like, dude, that was stopping. We about yeah. we and if we ain't getting the Snickers, we're gonna get one of them Nutter Butters because <laughs> those dudes. <laughs> Like, <laughs> isn't that the truth? I swear, if he was sitting here right now, <laughs> and you offered him a thousand bucks or just a nutter butter, <laughs> the nutter butter would go. Boy. It would, and and there's two in a pack, so we're gonna get some too. <laughs> that's so right. that's right. Well, that's the other thing I always loved about dad is is, um, and I tell this to people all the time is I grew up in a family that all of us kids and and w- the door was always open, and so when mom cook something she never knew if one was going to be there or if there's going to be 20 there yeah and she always had enough to feed everybody but at, at dad always sat at the head of the table but he didn't eat any more than the rest of us like it was and i've always looked at that and went you know dad just wasn't that kind of guy like he didn't need the attention he didn't he didn't try to take more than than the other people or nothing mm-hmm. like like here it is, and and it was that way at Dad's table, and everything he ever did, he he, uh, uh, and and so in business, I took that same concept in business. Just because I'm an owner of a business doesn't mean that I get to eat more than everybody else. 
man. So that's huge. That's, uh, and and I like to share with my team that I want to I want to work for them just as hard as they work for me. I I I'm not here for a free ride and never intended that. Yeah. So. Well, we can get off into that too. You're a successful businessman. I've learned so much from you. Uh, I've also learned some things not to do, Dad. And I ain't gonna lie. I ain't gonna even go hide it. No. I I tell this story and I I just I love it to death because if uh if you if there's a king of faking it till you make it man you wear the crown and i'm a close (laughs) prince because uh i will never forget and and i'm not trying to embarrass you here nothing like that but this is good i remember sitting next to you and we were down in fort worth and Uh chesapeake natural gas you just got awarded a 24 inch line to go Uh from fort worth to weatherford yeah and uh, you you answered the phone. Here's Chesapeake, and you have it on speakerphone uh, over the truck, so I can hear everything. Uh-huh. And the guy's like, "Hey, man, uh, we need to know who your bending engineer is, and when the bender's going to be out here." And and y'all did. You're like, "Man, I, I got a good one. Uh, he's going to be out there soon." And <laughs> you just tell me like when we need to get there. And he's like, "Man, if you don't mind, you know, next Monday." We're going to get up with him, make sure, you know, he's got everything right. And you're just like, absolutely, he'll be there Monday. And you got off the phone, you looked me straight in the eyes, and you're just like, what the hell's a pipe bender? <laughs> I love it. And that's the- it was and it was just like, you were just like, dude, what, what, why, what yeah. is pipe bender? And sure enough, yeah, in that big bore pipe. And I had the, I had, I had it there. That whenever That's it right. came time for me, but I had no idea. But this is how fast it went for me in that world. It was down in the Barnett Shell, and we was about a fifty man um, company, and my brother Brad and I own this company, and it's Hayes Welding and Fabrication, and and I when I talked to Chesapeake. I had told them that we had been set in compressor stations. So we had set about 54 compressor stations between Independence, Kansas, to Kansas City. And I had some welders uh, drag up on me, and they was headed to Fort Worth. And I was like, what are you guys going to Fort Worth? They said, man, it's booming. So I told Brad, I said, well, Brad, I need to get down. Let's go on with it. (laughs) And so I did. And... uh, um, I went down there. I made a few phone calls. It came to be Chesapeake. Yeah, and so I, uh, I, I meet up with the man. Uh, this was like on a Thursday, and and uh, we're we're working at Payola. All fifty guys that we have is right south of Kansas City, and them projects weren't done yet. So. So, uh, but I go talk to Chesapeake. I hadn't even made it across the Red River back to Oklahoma yet, and I get another phone call. They said, hey, we really liked you. We want 15 guys, a couple track hoes, some dozers, yada, yada equipment. Mm -hmm. And uh, Monday morning, 7 o'clock at this address in Fort Worth. I was like, all right, I'll be there. I had no idea who in the world I could get to, to do this. And uh, so I had over the weekend to uh, to find 15, 18 guys and this equipment and and uh, made a few phone calls and talked to a few people and had them there. And within a, so we started out with 15 people and and probably within two months, I was up over 200 employees down there. And I was not in the pipeline industry like the pipeline side of it. We'd been in the the distribution side of natural gas, but it's short sections. You never had to bend any pipe. Mm-hmm. And I and I working on the compressor sites and I never had to bend pipe. So whenever that man made that phone call to me and it's twenty four inch, uh and a dude, that the whole the whole process of the engineer and the bending the pipe and laying your right way out. It is some amazing, some amazing stuff. And fortunately, I I had the ability to meet people. Just like you were saying, that handshake and and you remember uh, 
and I called some friends and we knew people and and uh uh voila next thing I know we're we're invoicing the two million a week. Yeah. You know? So it's pretty amazing. It was but amazing. if you think that it's you cool have ride. to know everything to get in business, that that's what that's you don't. You don't have to know everything to get into business. Uh so if I if I waited till I knew everything to do something, I would never do it to begin with. So now looking back, I I got a lot of things that go, oh man, I probably shouldn't have done that, you know. <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, that's part of the being a cowboy. Yeah. So, well, Dad, Rhonda's going to kill me. We got to take that spur off. Oh, am I shaking it too much? <laughs> we got to. We can just take that one off right there. That's that's my nervous. Yeah, <laughs> I can already hear Miss Rhonda. Which, by the way, Rhonda's dad's wife, my stepmom. Yes. which she is awesome. Shout out to Miss Rhonda. Yeah. But I can already hear her just going. She's probably already counted however many times she heard that. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Let me know. Hey, uh, uh, my some of my team down at the Fab Shop made these spurs. I love those. Spurs. I want to give them a shout out. Yeah. Man. Uh, I got a wonderful team, and uh, they're very good. And they made these for my birthday one year. That um, they made them out of a, a file. That's a rasp. A rasp. Yeah, that's yeah. cool. Yeah. So, was it JJ? Uh, well, Kyle, uh, definitely ha- was kind of the part. the leader of it, and then JJ, yep. I believe, and and I'm not quite for sure who all was involved, but they made the rows. The pen, they made all of it. That's awesome. Just so everybody knows, my father owns a very successful fabrication facility down in Okima, Oklahoma. They are a code vessel shop. They, uh, right now, I mean, things are, whew, with the Rona and all that and business, but up, oh, fluctuating between 40, 50 employees right now, Dad, mm-hmm. yeah. and uh, do business for all kinds of people. I know the listeners probably don't need launchers, receivers, and things like that, but I think they do need to know that PCW is one of the largest employers in the town, and you guys do contribute a lot. And there's there's a lot of families that get food on the table because of what you have done and, and the team that you've put together. And and it's cool to be a part of that in a way and, and to grow up uh, with a dad that just always had a welding machine handy. Mm-hmm. And yeah. if you want it, go get it. Go get it. And uh, the team down there is phenomenal. J.J., Kyle Lineweaver, my cousin who runs the deal at top notch as good as they get. And yeah. and um what's really cool, Dad, that you've done down there is you allow people to do what they're there to hire to do and and you really let people reach their full potential. Mm-hmm. And I've learned a lot from that. And now that I'm in a project management position, I really have to tell myself that that, hey, like you you're you don't have to know everything. Yeah. Let them people work and let them do what they're good yeah. at. And yeah. then whenever they need help, assist them and let them let them figure out how to reach their full potential. Yeah, and you do that really well. Yeah. And platinum cross welding, man, top top quality, top yeah. stuff. Yeah. Well, I learned that at a young age. I figured out, uh, and I tell people this a lot. Like I'm no brain surgeon, but I spent some quality time with one. <laughs> and thank goodness he was the one doing the surgery, and not me. Yeah. You know, so. I, I've never felt like I had to be that that guy that that uh, had to do everything. Yeah. I just that, that wasn't in my uh, in in my character. Mm-hmm. I I wanted to give people opportunity to spread their wings and fly. And when you do that, you create your competition too, because not all employees are going to stay your employees. Well. They say Craig Groeschel, our pastor at Life Church. He always says you can either give them ownership, they're gonna, yeah, they're gonna well, go then, get their own. That's right. Deal. That's right. And, you and can't uh, keep a good leader for long. And 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 shame on you if you try to. Yep. If if you feel like you've got to keep people in a cage for you to become better, that that's yep. that, I've I've never felt that. I'm gonna I'm gonna try to influence people to be the very best that they can be yeah and if they choose that they can they can better their family or they can better themselves by yeah by doing something else you know i'm i don't want to be one of them type of people that that say 
No, you, if you're not working for me, you, you can't. I can't like you. What I you? think, Dad. I think the world needs to hear that from somebody, and that's something you've always told me, and I find real reassurance in it. And that is, if you have a better opportunity and you present it to your current boss or whoever you're working for, and they make you feel bad, you don't need to be working for them anyway. Mm -hmm. they'll either step up to the plate and figure out how to keep you or do whatever they need to do. And I like loyalty. Loyalties are great. You know, I had a dog once. I know what it feels like. Yeah. But <laughs> a uh, good dog. A good my, dog. <laughs> <my>. <laughs> but you know what? Um, if you're listening to this and you're struggling making a decision that could better you or your family or anything and your current employer or your cur current business or they don't aren't in agreement with it, check your circle. And, yeah. and check where you're at. And you've always instilled that in me. Yeah. Well, back in the early days, I, I did that too. I had a man, uh, and and uh, uh, he's a very successful business owner. Uh, Arlo is his name. And and, uh, and 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 I was very thankful that Arlo gave me all the opportunities that he did. And uh, I he had moved me up to being the superintendent and, and uh, I'd got to be a superintendent of some very large construction projects, and and uh, but I came home and uh, really felt like it was the time for me to make this move, and and I went and I talked to Arlo and and just told him Arlo, I'd I would rather be a minnow in my own pond than a shark in your ocean, and he respected that. He respected that. I didn't take any clients. I didn't take any employees. I didn't do anything underhanded. It actually took me a couple of years before because I just had to go back and work on my tools and do different things for me to to uh, to find my my opportunities and and uh, but they came my way. But this is a this is another thing. I was just honest. I didn't try to steal from Arlo. I didn't try to take his his clients. I didn't take his people. Uh, yep. It was a straight up, and I believe that's another cowboy thing right there. It's when you're straight up. Uh, 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 I've always appreciated that. Um, um, but one thing is about opportunity, and uh, your cousin Rochelle reminded me of this. Uh, she called me up the other day and uh, just shared with me that uh, she'd been reading this book. And, and what's so funny about it, it was one of your Papa Neil's favorite books, too. And, and here again, I've never been a real good reader. Uh, it just wasn't in my DNA to really read and comprehend and uh, a lot of a lot of things like that. Now I'm a, a good listener, and so when Dad, Dad, he read these books, and Dad listened to these tapes and stuff. Well, he would visit with me about that stuff. But uh, uh, it was a book, uh, "Think and Grow Rich" mm -hmm. by I believe Napoleon Hill. I want to say. Yeah. But Rochelle called me up the other day and just said, hey, I'm reading this book, and I just want to say thank you for for all that you have done, you know. And you never you never gave up, and you never quit. And I was like, oh, that's so wonderful. I'm going to share something with you that your papa Neil loved that book that you're reading. That's cool. Right there. And uh, he had it in his library. And, yeah. And uh, but But one of the conversations that we started having is, the thing that people don't realize is opportunity usually doesn't show up in the form that you think it's going to show up at. So so when you're looking for opportunity, if you try to figure out what that opportunity is going to look like when it shows up, you're usually not going to recognize it when it does show up. And a lot of times opportunity comes through a whole nother form of it's it's not the glamorous uh, opportunity that you want to imagine. It usually comes through something that you never expected, and many times it's not a real pleasant experience. But you look back and go, "Wow, that was opportunity." Yeah, right there. Well, and a lot of it's turned a problem into opportunity, into opportunity. and so I have a huge drinking opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> I appreciate you recognizing that.
this might go on a little while. You did pay the electric bill, didn't you? I did. <laughs> so. Came in. Got that got that <laughs> Trump check, boys. Hey. Ain't that nice. No, I actually didn't get it, but oh. just pull the trigger on it, Daddy. Right there where your thumb's at. Yep. Oh. You know, speaking of current current uh situations in our world, I got another thank you for being a badass daddy dad, and that is you helped many, many people of different ethnicities, different races. You never once raised me or my brother to look at color or to judge somebody on their background, where they come from, and you always told us that it's about their heart. And I have a really cool thing, and I don't even know if you remember doing this. And and it leads into the fact that I love the fact that you never you never steered clear of odd conversations, of hard conversations with us, uh, whether it be drugs, drinking, sex, all of it. You you hit it head on. Mm-hmm. And I remember being probably in middle school. You were driving. Me and little brother were with you, and we saw an interracial couple on Main Street. Mm-hmm. And, and I remember you looking at me and my brother and you, you sincerely said, look, boys, I don't care what color they are. I just want to know she has a good heart. And if you love them, I love them. And I think more kids today need to hear that from their daddy. They do. They do. Because some of the best people in this world, and it ain't, it ain't just black and white. They're all different kind of color. And, and, uh, yeah, I just, I think that was really cool. And as this world is going down this this crazy turn of events and and as we sit back watching you handle it and watching how you give advice to others and and how you just listen and you're like hey you know like if there's somebody in our community that's hurting and doesn't feel like they're hurt or they're mistreated we just need to listen we need to come together and and, well, and help and I, and I agree with you and I I'm glad that you're not scared to talk about uh tough topics on on this podcast son what it's all about and and if you if you're if you're thick skinned um this industry is going to make you thick skinned you know yep uh but but uh th- these are some things that i really feel and one is is when you look at people for being people you just quit looking at people at, like they're different than than you at and 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 uh, here again I might not be politically correct in anything but I've never had a problem with anybody for being a a different color than me now this is maybe something that I have fell short on is realizing the intents of the problem just because it's because it doesn't really affect me. I don't feel yeah. that way. So I just assume that nobody feels that way. Well, that's that's not the truth and it's a sad thing uh that America is going through what America is doing yep. right now. And and it can't be about race. But let me tell you something about your great grandfather. Um, his name was Nob Hayes, and he was from Seminole, Oklahoma. And my dad was born in 1935, so this was this is uh, uh, Papa Neal's dad. He was the black man's banker. He was the black man's any time that that a, a black man in Seminole, Oklahoma, back in them days, needed legal advice. My grandpa, which was a huge Democrat, major big Democrat. And would would had had a, the avenue for all of the black community to be able to come to him. He could get them legal help. He could get them doctor's help. He uh, he gave them financial assistance. And all Grandpa Hayes did is he dealt with scrap metal. It's not like like he was some, but he that just had he had a third grade education. Uh, he uh, he died a millionaire. From what I've been told, uh, I didn't actually see any of that money, or or <laughs> nobody actually offered me any <laughs> of that money. But uh, um, grew up in tough times when the banking uh, through the Great Depression and stuff. So he didn't trust banks. He he hid 
his money a lot, but he helped the black community out. He was back in them days, like that a, a black man just couldn't get the same legal help that the white man could get. And now I grew up in a world that I just assume everybody gets all the help that they need. You know, uh, whenever you're not a racist person, you're not a you don't see all of them issues and we've never been racist whatsoever but the one thing that i can say is nobody's going to reach success without somebody's help you know shame on on whoever felt like one man is better than another man no matter what their skin color is whether you want to we live in oklahoma you can get into the indian you can get in to to the indian people and the same issues exist there the same issues exist with with anybody that comes from another country. I'm I'm sure that whenever we start talking about race, it's not just between black and white. Like like we're talking about just good old common sense. You just look at people like people. You talk to people like they're people. Yeah. You respect people because they're people, and you listen to people. And I come from the part of the country, big ranch country. You know what? The black cattle. The red cattle, the brown cattle, the white cattle, they all are in the same pasture and seem to all be eating grass and every all of them are content, you know. Medium rare, please. Medium rare. That's right. Well, that you, you used to have a red steer named Medium Rare right That's right. Oh, MR. MR. You, you remember MR? Sure tasty. Hey, oh, MR. <laughs> MR served us, served us well. Served us well. Yeah. He did. Yeah. So. Well, I love that I got to be raised with a father that never, ever once, and I sincerely mean that, you never, ever once said that one person is better than the other yeah. growing up, ever. And I actually do remember you taking in and helping people, and not just black people. It ain't about mm-hmm. that. Like, you helped yeah. people, brought them to our home, got them back on their feet, yeah. and and I just think that's really phenomenal. I think yeah. it makes it tough in these times, too. It, it's confusing me yeah. because what you said – when you're not racist, you don't understand it, and you're right. Like it's hit me like it, like I'm 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 listening, and for you guys in the, for those in the black community that are just doing the protest right, and you you are really coming from a caring heart and talking. I just want to say we're listening, and and I think all all good people are, and not just white people. I think we all are going. Wow, okay, you're making a point. And, and I think you can totally love, uh, all people. And I think you can totally support good cops. I think we can all do that. It all starts a good conversation, right? That's it all right. starts with being, being, coming with a concern and, and getting through it with conversation because my eyes have been opened. Mm-hmm. Uh, shout out to Craig Rochelle, Life mm-hmm. Church. I loved his sermon on it. Um, it, it. It's it's a tough topic that isn't needing your mouth, man. It's not needing your your Facebook posts. It's needing you to sit back and just listen and hear these people out. And that's all they're asking for. So just the other day, for a good example, I'll let you guess. No, I won't either. Because <laughs> I'll just tell you because that's the kind of guy I am. But, but so... A, a, a white guy just snubbed me at this at the gas station, man, just walked right past me and didn't make eye contact with me or, yeah. or nothing. I said hello to him. He didn't reply, just yeah. like I wasn't there, you know. And I'm like, man, I feel sorry for that guy. Well, it wasn't long. I was filling up again, and a black gentleman walked by me. He said, how are you doing today? I said, I'm doing great, sir. How are you? He said, I'm doing great, you know. Dude, that didn't have anything to do with color. Not didn't at all. have anything. He 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 was very respectful and 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 yep. was a, a very nice young man. And I I was like, you know, yeah, it's 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 in people's character. The the good people are good people. Bad people are bad people. And we we have we have the mix. You know, it it's there's there's good people and there's bad people, and. And what's so sad is is a lot of there's good people and bad people that are in the police. There's in teaching, in in real influential uh, 
uh, roles. You know, being a parent is is one of the. I feel like it is the most important role, and and whenever you start looking within yourself to be the solution, and and when there is a problem, you look at yourself first. I I think that America is still the greatest country on earth, and I still believe that that uh, the best is yet to come, like. Like, well, you know, we're not through. We're not through with this process. It, it's going to get better. Yeah, I agree. So. What we got right is we believe in the sovereign individual. We give the benefit of the doubt to the individual, and we give them the chance to better themselves. That's right. And to get, when when the leader gets better, we all get better. That's, I agree with that. And I love that, that the black community is really pulling together. They're, mm-hmm. they're making their voice heard. Mm-hmm. We're listening, and we're going to move forward forward stronger that's right i agree i agree now the looting i'm just gonna let y'all know uh and what's weird is all the looting i i haven't even seen a whole lot most of them skinny white boys running around and i'm just gonna let you know uh if anybody's gonna surprise me at my house at midnight I got something by my bed that it's, put down a dragon, bro. Yeah, it's not a good time, to, dude. It's, it's not, not a, a good, good time. time to surprise people. Not a I'm, good time. I'm telling you, dude. Um, mentioning that, my my lovely bride that I'm so in love with, her name's Rhonda, and uh, uh, she's a successful businesswoman. Yep. Came up through the banking industry, and and uh, has made it to the top of the food chain in in uh, her corporate ladder, and so I'm very proud of Rhonda K and and uh always want to brag on her but so she was upstairs with the grandkids a few nights back and and uh, I thought I would just be funny and jump up there and scare her and I caught one luckily I got my face out of the way and just caught it in the uh, up high in my shoulder where she hit me but uh I was happy she didn't have the pistol because she's also a good shot uh, Her too. daddy's a sheriff, okay. right? Or, uh, Let me tell you. Well, he was a, a assistant chief of police, is an uh, investigator. And now, Rhonda K and I, we met later in life, so so we're still newlyweds. Uh, well, we can three, tell. Makes me years. sick. <laughs> <laughs> Makes me sick. Uh, we uh, we love each other, but. Uh, that, uh, Whenever I first went out and met her dad, and, uh, of course, shooting guns. they Like, Rhonda is a whole lot better with a handgun than I am. Like, she was raised being able to handle a gun. Dude. And so I find it real interesting when, when uh, women are intimidated with a gun because my wife is not one of them. Like, she's, she's, gonna, she's not scared to pull that out and hit what she's aiming at but her dad she says he says well hey let's go out here and shoot some pistols i was like okay all right i'm down for that and go out there and dude he just pulled that dude from the hip and fired three rounds and hit that silver dollar and he says now now tell me what's your intentions with my daughter now we're in our 50s dude being a daddy doesn't quit whenever they're just young you know and uh I said, sir. He was in his 70s maybe when he told you this? or Oh, oh no. He would have been in his 80s. <laughs> well, he's 85. What are your yeah. intentions, boy? What's your intentions with my daughter? And uh, I said, well, sir, just uh, anything you want me to do <laughs> this time. <laughs> Well, uh, <laughs> I, I, right now I'm just, I'm just going to visit with you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So no, but it, it was wonderful. And, and, uh, here again, when we start getting into racist stuff, is um, um, they come from South Dakota and dealing with with um, some Indian tribes and back in the seventies and stuff and all of that movement. Rhonda can get a lot more into detail, but he was actually held hostage uh, by a by a, a tribe, and like, dude, it gets to be some serious stuff, you know. Holy smokes! So. Dad, not to dig into your marriage life, but I feel we have a listener that's possibly listening to this podcast that has maybe gone through a failed marriage, and they feel they feel they're a failure. Mm-hmm. 
what is so cool about you, Dad, is is yeah, you you are newly married as of the last three years, right? Uh-huh. Uh, you, Miss well, Rhonda. Now, now, you do have editing power, so if I mess, <laughs> if, let's not get into the deal. So if I mess this yeah. up, but will you? No. can you correct it? But somewhere? what's cool? I think it's three years. What's cool is you got it right, man. Yeah, you got it right, and it it's it's not only good for you guys; it's good for everybody involved. And I just feel I, I have friends. Uh, I've I've talked to people that feel that because their marriage that they were in didn't work out. And I know you, and I know that you believe in marriage and that you never say quitting on a marriage is the answer. But whenever it's gone, there's still room to be successful. And you're not a failure. And you you can still be and find that love of your life yes. and, and do great things and have have a great have a great marriage, man. Well, I, I want your listeners to know a, a few things. But, yes, I, I, I have multiple uh, exes, and they all have one thing in common. Uh, I was the problem. <laughs> so <laughs> After the fourth or fifth one, you start yeah. thinking. Well, you start, you, you have a, you know, and, and, and Rhonda Kay is my fifth marriage. Yep. Uh, I've, I've had lots of challenges uh, in that. But the one thing that I I can honestly tell you, if you're going through difficult times right now, I would encourage you not to use uh, the kids as leverage. Man, and that was something that your mom and I had a good understanding on, is even though whatever problems we had, it was not our children's fault. And, and, And so... Let's let's whatever problems we have, let's do the best we can to make sure our children know they are loved, and and you guys did a phenomenal job of that. And so, uh, she was real good about that, and and uh, uh, and so uh, she is the only one that I had children with. Yep, and but. There is some real challenges that come in with them uh, feeling like a failure of feeling like, because that was the one thing my dad provided and my mom for me is that good foundation, solid cornerstone. Um, I, I did not come from a broken family. My I'm the only one out of five kids that that have had these challenges in these marriages. Um, not saying that they haven't had challenges, but where actual divorces mm-hmm. and and uh, and so then you look at yourself going, gosh, I you know I can't do anything. Well, there has it goes right back to looking at yourself when you're down on your knees and your face on the ground, and you you. Look at yourself. You you find that inner strength that, hey, I'm going to get up. I'm going to hold my head high. And when I figured out that I could not always control how everybody else felt, and, and lots of times I just assumed that everybody felt the way I did, especially the person I was married to. I just assumed that they felt exactly like I did. To be honest with you, I can look back and and uh, hindsight's always twenty twenty. But I can see how I put my business, um, um, like like I just had this, I just had this desire to be a good business owner. I wanted to be a good business owner, and uh, many times I put that first. Rhonda Kay is probably the only woman that she became my passion. She became my uh, my dream. And it took me being, after my dad passed away, I was in my 50s, and it, and it hit me like, Dad, the thing that I loved about my dad is he loved my mom. And he... And I want that. I want to truly be in love. Some of the marriages I got into, it was it wasn't because of the love I had for the person, but the love for their kids. And I, and so I I kind of found myself in in that role. Do you feel like you're also looking for just that puzzle piece to 
put like just put like you just needed a like you needed somebody to fit that yeah yeah i i look back and and um um maybe i was i was thinking that i could solve their problems you know like mm -hmm. man uh, i could solve all of their problems me yep well when when you get into a relationship like that you're starting off on the wrong foot first of all you as a person are not going to be able to solve all of your spouse's problems that well, i haven't been able to. so <laughs> if y'all get to know me i haven't been real successful <laughs> i've never been married <laughs> i haven't they come and go. Um, I might but, have to be responsible. For uh, that. I, 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 <laughs> I've been in a few of them that could easily have been marriages. I'll yeah, tell you that. Yeah. And and I was real confused after the last one. And I went to Portugal. I went to Spain. Yeah, man, Spain Spaniards don't always like the old American coming find them. Really, that's a whole other story though. But uh, I went. I was in Portugal, and I was in a hostel, and and. Some of y'all are going to laugh at me, but I didn't know exactly what a hostel was. So a hostel is a place where you just pay for the bed, pretty much. Instead of paying the $200 a night for a hotel room, you're in a bunk bed for 20 bucks a night. And I make good money. I wasn't real excited about this, but my, my traveling partner is a tight wad. But I'll give it, He's got money, though. Yeah. He's got some money because he's a tight wad. So I'll give him that. Ben, love you. So... We're in Portugal, and I'm sitting there, and this this gentleman, in he's probably in his 60s. He's a good-looking man. He's got a nice blazer on. And I see him, and he stays in the room that we're in. It's a room with six bunk beds in it. And his name was Tark. And I had a life-changing conversation with Tark that day. And we just got to talking, and, and I was really lost. I mean, I was almost in tears. I was just like, man, I'm just... The whole direction of my life has been recently changed. I thought I was going to be married, and I thought I was going to have a significant other. I thought I had kids to look forward to, and, and it, it all kind of went away. Rightfully so, it went away. Uh, and just a little bit, I talked to Tark. He looked me right in the eyes, and he said, Taos, you can't be somebody's savior and their king at the same time. And he said, never start a relationship with anybody, whether it be a relationship, a friendship, a business partnership, never start a relationship with somebody in a point of weakness. He said, now, that doesn't mean you give up on the person. It's just a point of weakness. They will get back on in, into a swing of strength. He said, always start those relationships with somebody at a point of strength. Quit trying to save people. Mm -hmm. You can't be a savior and their king at the same time. And for it to be a, a solid relationship, you're a king wanting to find a queen. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, you'll give your shirt off your back. And when it's all said and done, they'll remind you they never asked for it. That's right. They never asked for it. And, and rightfully, yeah. That, yeah. and that's so right. And it's true. It's not their fault. That's right. And I had this wonderful conversation. And I gave him a Tabak cigar. Me and Dad's favorite. Nice. We've smoked over nice. 200 some cigar. Nice. We've tried them all. These are our favorite Tabaks. For sure. I'm not sponsored by them. We just love them. And uh -huh. and uh, I gave him a Tabak cigar, and we sat there and talked. And he just, it was when, it, when I just needed to hear that I was a good man, and that I was just aiming to to save people. That's not what a good relationship's on. And I think you and Rhonda really embody that. I feel like you you Rhonda is a beautiful, independent, strong woman, the VP of a bank, dude, and comes home and makes cookies. Like you can do it both. And for everybody out there that thinks like you either gotta be a badass businesswoman or you gotta go look through the kitchen window all day, man. She loves she loves her kids. She loves us. She takes care of us and she is a boss during the yeah. day. And she yeah. does it both. And I think that's why you guys have worked out so well from what I can tell is like like it, this sounds weird. I hate this, dad. And maybe you can help me decipher what I'm saying. Y'all don't need each other. We you want. want each other. Yeah. Like she, she financially or anything y'all could split oh, yeah. and go but you couldn't live without each other. Right. 
because yeah. of what what you guys provide. And I think it's really cool also that you found out that that may, finding that right woman takes you maybe you were you were replacing things with your business. Mm-hmm. Business is a booming, bro. Like right. like you found the right woman and she supports you and she's made you the better person. I'm better. You're better. I, I, I really am. And it's just it's just something that's uh an interesting I don't know what here again. I'm not I got that high school education. I'm not real wed. I'm not real uh studied up on that. I kinda get into my own little world and that's reading a tape measure and a level and, mm-hmm. and meeting needs of, of other people. So um but but here again, if you're going through a divorce and uh I, I I still say that's the first thing, just look inside of you. Quit thinking that they are the problem. Start looking at you. Not saying that you can fix the marriage, not saying that that you're a bad person, however that however it works out. But when you look within yourself, you find that that uh you have that strength. You have that strength as a uh, as the person you are. And I encourage people, man, just because bad just because a storm comes your way, man, don't be scared to saddle up and and just yeah. ride. Yeah, like you can't you can't you can't get into that depression. And it and I've been there. I've been there and yeah. and it takes uh uh, there's there's good people out there that will listen to you, and and and. Uh, but, well, but, I can tell you this: if you are somebody listening right now, and you really are having one of those tough goes and just tough time, you can always email me at a cardigan cowboy. Doc, I think my email is Taos. It's on my website, but um, we'll always help and we'll always find you somebody to listen and get get you right. through because you're not alone and. And that's what the cowboy spirit's really about, yeah. and and that's what we want to embody. Yeah. And um, well, I re- I truly believe that that it is the cowboy spirit is when you know a storm is coming and you still saddle up and ride. Like, dude, it's coming. It's going to be bad. It's going to hurt, but I'm saddling up and I'm 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 going to be a part of it. Yeah. And and a lot of times. Uh, I've been humbled. I've been hu- very humbled in in that yeah. uh, process. So, and I kind of like that humble pie, man. Dude, humble pie. I, I've sure ate some of it. Can be freaking bitter. Well, I'm telling you. <laughs> Forgot but, a little sugar, but <laughs> sometimes I she's like, cold. I like Miss Rhonda's cookies a whole lot more. Oh, man. Than <laughs> Thank God for Miss Rhonda's cookies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, I just think you guys have such a great example of it's yep. never too late to get right. Yeah. It's never too late. That's right. And things are going to get better. Also, Dad, like something we didn't really talk, we talked about you being over over positive in, in, a, bad, in a good way, not bad. You, you've always been over positive. But what's cool is you've also always let us know that being positive is not denying the situation you're in. Being positive is knowing that the situation you're going to be in is going to be better. It's going to get better. And that's what I love about your positivity is you never like try to like it's, you've never seen somebody dying of cancer and just be like, oh, yo, you're good. Like, we're going to be happy. No, you're like, no, this hurts. This sucks. But it's going to get better. It's going to we have that positivity. That's right. And I think that was really cool growing up with is just like, man, we, we went through some we went through some shit. Hey. And, and you were like, hey, you have been bucked off. I we've promise been bucked you off. So. You have been bucked off. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of bucked off, I think this is where we should talk one of, about one of your biggest mess ups, Dad. <laughs> these shaps, I want these people to know these shaps that lay in the back of the studio. These have a story. These have a really I think cool story. That's so cool that you you have this. Oh, they're so and, my favorite. And looking at this is, I want to talk about the shaps, but I want to talk about the. the uh, I mean, like what you have on this wall, yeah, right here. Now, is that the gray hat that you was talking about earlier? Oh, yeah, it is. Is that it? It is, yeah. A shorty's, uh, yeah. yeah. I love that you have the American flag because yep. we're so patriotic. That's too. right. 
Uh, we, um, uh, well, don't be avoiding your mess up. So let's. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I so, love it. So look closely, okay. folks. They're stitching. This is these shaps are pieced together. Yeah. They're they. Oh yeah, and the other leg. Uh, so this is the, this is what went down whenever all of that happened. So I was a young, I was a youngster. I, this was pre-brain surgery. Pre, yeah, before my brain surgery, and Brent, my oldest brother. Uh, had ordered these shaps. I'm going to interrupt you real quick just so you all know. My dad is one of five, and they all start with B's. So they share the same initials, Brent, right. Brad, Bart, Brock, and Becky. That's right. And Uncle so, Brent got them. So they were, they, that BH really stood for Brent Hayes. And I beg Brent to let me get on this bear rack horse. And I'll have to think of, uh, I, I, I think we was at Scott City, Kansas. I think. Think I'd have to ask Brent to really clarify that. So uh, he says, "Okay." And I don't think he had even got on a bear rack horse with him yet. I talked to him the other day. He's never warm. He never warm. He never yeah, warm. Like like we just <laughs> got him in. Yep. And uh, I get hung up on this bear rack horse, and he drags me around this arena, and uh, uh, actually kicked me while I'm. While I'm still hung up, it drug the bareback rigging over kind of to his side, and he kicked me with his front foot in the face. And uh, so I'm bleeding in the face. He stomps all over me. They finally get this horse stopped, and, and uh, of course, there's pieces of the shafts laying all over the arena. And, and uh, uh, I'm crying. He, he, he really hurt my arm, too. He had stepped... And I still have a scar. You know, we all have these scars that we like to talk about. Oh, yeah. And uh, Chicks dig it, I hear. <laughs> so so uh, I, uh, uh, I'm i crying. I'm crying this. And How old were you, Dad, by chance? I mean, you had to be 13. I was 12. 13. 13. I, I was riding some pretty big horses by that time. So, so uh, I was probably 13. And... Uh, uh, he, uh, he said, uh, where, where are you hurting at? Tell me where you hurt at. And I said, I'm not hurt, but my big brother's going to kill me when he sees these shafts. <laughs> and I'm so scared of Brent. <laughs> me and my brothers got along real good. Uh, they knew they could whip me, and I knew it too. So, so <laughs> I, never, I never had a problem with that. But. Dude, like, how do you work? That's how I always tell people. Like, everybody's like, are you a badass mother trucker? And I'm like, Dude, I wasn't even the badass in my household. <laughs> Dude, like, ain't that the truth? My little brother <laughs> whooped the snot out of me. Like, come on, bro. Like, yeah. dude. Yeah, I, I definitely did not. Uh, you was not going to be the toughest in my family. No, I promise you. And uh, um, so, so uh, anyway, that's the story with the Shaps. Uh, we, Stitched them up, we, and they hung in Papa Neil's office. In his office, yep, yep. In Dad's office, he kept them. And <laughs> who picked up all the pieces uh, in the arenas? I see. I don't know. I can't remember who stitched them up or anything. But but we got them all put back together. But uh, that was and that and I believe that was actually the only time that ever been worn at all. I don't think anybody else ever. I I never I I never did wear them again. No, I think I, Uncle Brent said. Like, no, no, they hung in dad's office. They were one and done. <laughs> one and done. That was it. And, uh, but what an experience. <laughs> what an experience. <laughs> that reminds me of the story of you selling Uncle Brad's go kart and then to your friend, oh. and you're just like, well, at least I pocket the change. I still get to ride it. It's okay. just right across the street. So I got to, <laughs> so we're sitting at the supper table. And, uh, uh, so the neighbor, Clifford, he, uh, he was my brother Brad's best friend, so so Brent and Brad had the go kart. Clifford wanted the go kart. I wanted the four ten that Clifford had, and so I sold Brent and Brad's go kart, and uh, plus got twenty five dollars. Got the four ten plus twenty five dollars. Oh, from Clifford, dude. And uh, so Dad uh, was sitting there at the table. Of course, Brent and Brad and are all there. And uh, he says, uh, Bart, uh, you know, we need to talk about something. You know, this is back in the day when at the supper table you talked as a family. Uh, yeah. Which some of that stuff is kind of, kind of, I mean, if you just look at that, you just take that one thing right there and go, wow, 
at supper time, we used yeah. to all sit and just talk and, yeah. and visit. So Daddy says, Bart, is there something you want to tell me? I go, no, no, it's all good, man, no problems. And uh, he says, well, tell me this deal about the go-kart. You want to <laughs> kind of enlighten me here? And, dude, I like, you know about that? <laughs> and uh, he said, um, yeah, yeah, I kind of know uh, Anyway, you take twenty five bucks to shut up, <laughs> Daddy. <laughs> oh, and, Papa. Uh, and uh, he said, uh, "Well, Bart, wh- wh- why do you think you have the right to sell your brother's go kart?" And I said, "Well, they can still ride it anytime <laughs> they want." <laughs> I mean, Clifford's over here than he is at his own house. It's right there still. <laughs> it's like still. we can see it from here. <laughs> I just, I, uh, I just thought it sounded like a good, like a good thing. He said, "Well, first of all, I need you to take whatever Clifford gave you and give that back to him, and you go over there and you get that go kart, and it stays over here." Dad didn't, he didn't get mad and cuss or nothing. You know, it was just handled like that. I, I gave Clifford the four ten and the twenty five dollars back, and and that's uh, awesome. And got the go kart. Well. I hope our listeners are still enjoying our stories. I got another one that I just think is hilarious, so don't leave us here. But the fact that Papa Neil caught you in a a, 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 a lie shooting a bird, a hawk. Oh, yeah. But something everybody needs to know, my grandmother was the coolest. And I know you might be a penny. I think you had a cool grandmother, whatever. <laughs> you know, Mine was the coolest because she had a morbid fear of birds. And I'm telling you, she didn't care if it was the most endangered species of hawk sitting on the porch, buddy. You knock it down. Yeah. And and she hated birds. And yeah. I, that was such a cool way to grow up, but have a grandma that hated birds because, I mean, there's nothing. I mean, not only were you doing something you enjoy shooting birds, but you were saving your grandmother. Yeah. You know, it was like, dude. Well, okay, for me to tell you this story, you kind of have to realize that mom is just what you said. She was deathly is afraid of birds like to the point where she couldn't enjoy the beach she couldn't enjoy a lot of things because that bird was there and so whenever she gave you a, a, a bb gun she expected you to be a good shot with that yeah. like dude you're going to take this gun and you kill that bird so anyway now uh uh it's it's one of them days and this hawk we had a rabbit in the backyard and and uh so th- this hawk lands across and there, it's over in mrs light mrs light was the music teacher beautiful light and and uh so uh did you I, say Be- beauty beulah 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 wow beulah light Miss light and uh she was absolutely a wonderful teacher and and uh but they had this. I this, feel like he was about to say she's beautiful. No, 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 no. Uh, okay, nothing. Wasn't like nothing. the hot teacher. No, she was not. Okay, no. no. Love but, you, Miss Light. But uh, 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 so this bird, this hawk, is over there, and I had a Benjamin one seventy seven caliber pellet gun, dude. Like I'm talking, this thing was the real deal, and. Uh, uh, I make a heck of a good shot, man. Nobody really appreciated that. Nobody, no, like that was kind of lost. <laughs> you know? yeah. And so, first of all, I sneak in Mrs. Light's yard to get the bird, which nobody really knew that I did that. In fact, yeah. it might be the first time I'm actually confessing uh, that. But so I had to sneak in their yard to get this bird that I had shot. And I get this bird, and it's a beautiful hawk, man. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. What am I going to tell my dad? Now, Mom was scared of birds. I knew all I had to do is tell Mom I shot this they bird. Had feathers. And, and Mom was going to be – Dad was a different deal. Like, dude, Dad's not going to – this ain't cool. Like, I should not shoot this nice of a hawk. And – uh so I came up with this wild story that this bird landed on our fence and 
I was just going to protect our rabbit that we had in our backyard. And I come around the corner and I shoot this. And um, so dad, being the cool, calm, collected, uh, comes home. Mom says, hi, Bart saved the rabbit's life. He shot this hawk. and dad, Totally buys in. Oh, yeah. Dad, dad, uh, he said, well, come over here, son. Yeah, come show me exactly where was you standing at? And so, dude, like, okay. I didn't think this through. <laughs> I didn't think this through. <laughs> I wasn't ready for a follow-up, Dad. <laughs> Dad. Jeez. Couldn't you be like Mom? Just, <laughs> just, just love it. Just love it. <laughs> <laughs> so so, so uh, I, I, I talked to Dad, and I go out there, and I said, yeah, I just came around the corner, and he was sitting right there. And, and uh, man, I pulled down on him and got him the first shot. And Dad... Dad just shook his head. He said, son, that's not how that went down, is it? I said, no, Dad, it's not. He said, well, your mom's happy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So, well, so, so I've had a few of those instances with you, but <laughs> this interview's about you. Yeah, so we're yeah. going to keep it that way. <laughs> well, yeah. So, Oh, man. What a crazy world. Yeah, so we can move on. The okay, painting. the painting. Okay, that frame right there hung over my Uncle Don's. Uh, whenever you went down, he was from Mead, Kansas. Now, my Uncle Don Goodnight, if you'll research him, uh, he has he's a history buff on the whole the whole Western way of life. Yeah. And uh, his, which was my mom, my mom, Uncle Don and Uncle Ron are, Twins, so they was my mom's oldest brothers, and uh, Uncle Don was a pilot for um, uh, uh, WW Panels out of Dodge City. He was the corporate pilot, and then he was the man that taught people how to fly. So I I grew up with with cousins that flew planes, and and just being in the aviation or around that. Not yep. that I did that on a regular basis, but but the, flying in a plane was never a, a scary thing for That's us. That's cool. And uh, so that, that the frame. frame. Comes from Uncle Don. Uh -huh. And then on the back of that frame, I have my cousin Gary, who is an ear, nose, and throat specialist out of Abilene, Texas. And Kim, uh, um, he is a successful businessman from Dodge City now too yeah. went on to be their brothers both of them are brothers and and they're very successful but they're just good cousins they're, they're yeah. the cool cousins that that you got to to be with you yeah. know and and uh, which i have a lot of them but then the painting is is one of chances uh uh your cousin chance yep. paintings and so i just uh i just had that um that i put that it was just the right size to fit in that frame and yeah and uh, i love it well, shout out to Chancer, and we we'll always love him and support him. That's right. His endeavors. Yeah, and then the cardigan. Like, have you told your listeners about about uh, um, uh, the Big Lebowski? <laughs> no, I haven't, and, and that comes up quite a bit. People ask me what where did Cardigan Cowboy come from, and I have a lot of different. I mean, it's just a plethora of different different. Um, I don't know. I'm gonna stop and just amaze, just sit in amazement that I said plethora of my Bristol high education. That's pretty cool. So you, you might have to give me. I don't quite know. If I know the I'm not even gonna define it. So, so we're just we gonna might go just with skip it. on past. Yeah, that. we'll we'll edit that I, out. I wasn't gonna let people know I didn't understand. What you just said, <laughs> I have a whole lot of reasons why I picked Cardigan Cowboy. One of them is my aunt and uncle who live in Colorado. Every every spring break, every Christmas break, that's where we were skiing, and there were two movies. There were two movies that were mandatory with my Uncle Brock in his basement, and that is Tombstone, which yeah. is my absolute favorite <laughs> Western, uh -huh. which is your cowboy, uh -huh. and then The Big Lebowski, man. Yeah. And The Big Lebowski is the dude, and That's he right. wears a cardigan. Yeah, and how you have you got a passion, you've got a dream, and uh, I'm so excited to see that develop, but to know... The real deep roots yeah. of where that cardigan really, because you actually have a cardigan of the the same kind that that the dude the dude wore. wore too. Yeah, I bought it. Pendleton makes yeah. the exact cardigan that he wore in that show, and I bought me and my brother uh -huh. uh, one, and we absolutely love it. But 
um, I don't know. I just, I feel like I want to be a platform for people to tell their stories and change people's lives, not only motivate and, and inspire, but lead people to be better people, to yeah. be better versions of themselves. Yeah. When you start thinking about making an atmosphere that somebody feels comfortable, mm -hmm. give them a glass with whatever they want in it. If they like a cigar, I like to make smoke. Smoke them if you got them. Don't yeah. hide them, divide them. Uh -huh. And a fire. Yeah. But man, a cardigan. If you haven't felt the warmth of a cardigan, man, yeah. and sit back on a nice, cool fall night around a campfire yeah. with your cardigan cowboy hat on, I just, that's what we want to embody is we want to make a place comfortable. Uh, we're really excited. I, and I say we, I've hired a marketing team, Seven Bridges Marketing out of Tulsa. They're phenomenal and they believe in me and they're making this happen. And uh, they are paid. They are paid, and rightfully so. If anybody's out there wanting to get into media, marketing, whatever, these guys are the real deal, mm -hmm. seven bridges. But they, I don't know, they just they believe in what I'm standing for, and, and they went for it. And yeah. I was going to be called the Cardigan King um, just because I, I, I like how that sounds, but they just got, they were like, man, like you embody that West Western culture, like, you got to throw the cowboy in there, and, and that's what we're about because all my heroes are always cowboys, and yeah. and uh, I'm I'm here just to give a good platform for people to tell their story and change lives, and that's why you're my first guest. Is well, cause I'm very proud of you, and, and I think you'll be very successful at it, and, and uh, there's not a doubt in my mind. I'm, that's awesome. I I actually, um, um. You turned me on to Craig's uh, podcast. Yep, Craig Rochelle, yeah. Life Church. He okay. has a leadership podcast. Mm -hmm. mm. Uh, then, then I actually joined the church because I was so I was I was so intrigued with him on his from his business viewpoints uh, that that uh, you invited me to to go out there yep. to Life Church and and which you got to understand about me is. I'm kind of old cowboy, like like that's yeah. kind of what I I I stay in my little world, and uh, um, man, I reached out to some. I was like, "You're gonna watch it on a movie, like a like a movie screen," and yeah. and a lot of that stuff didn't really resonate with me. Uh, I was kind of closed minded, but I went, and wow, it's a game changer. It is. It is. And, and to all those that, that really uh, might make fun of that idea, I will tell you, like, the effort and the passion that are behind those messages mm -hmm. and and to use technology in that way, uh, yeah. it's it's for the good. Yeah. And, and uh, man, I tell you what, what he does, whenever you're, whenever they're asking for time, they send the bucket around, mm -hmm. and they openly say, like, if you are having a hard time making ends meet, if you haven't had a meal, you can take whatever. It, when the bucket comes around, man, you can take get yeah. get what you need. Yeah, I was hooked. Yeah. I was like, dude, this guy's I, got it right. I, I've seen a lot of things in my life. I'd never seen that. You yeah. know, uh, yeah. usually the security uh, they take the plate to the back, and the security is with them. And I mean, uh, you know, <laughs> right. so but. Um, I, I think it's great. No matter what your faith is, uh, that's your business. And, and right. uh, uh, well, I grew up uh, with the Christian faith, and, mm -hmm. and I raised you kids to, with the yep. Christian faith. Uh, so that, uh, uh, that, that, that I appreciate you inviting me uh, yeah. to that church, you know, yeah. and something that I, I just kind of closed minded about. Uh, but yet, I still went, and now we're we're big fans Hooked. of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and they take that. And Isaiah is a wonderful pastor there at Jinx, where, he is. where we actually go to. Dad, that's what they nailed, though. Yeah, they, is they, they're big, but they're yeah. small. That's right. We still See. get to talk to Isaiah, yeah. and we've yeah. become a fan of Savannah the singer there. Oh, oh my gosh! Like you just go top, out, you top, still get to top notch. You still get yeah. to like hug them and talk to them yeah. and be personal. So. It isn't this yeah. huge mecca, and, and the money uh, it goes to help so many local people. It does, too. and and uh, here again, um, we've always been raised that we feel like like 
we're just passing through this world like like uh we we know we know where we're headed to at the end of this yeah. and so everything here on earth is god's to begin with and and it's so nice that whenever you see see money that's going to help the the local the yeah. local people yeah. and and uh well Craig Rochelle, if you ever hear this, man, uh, you're one of the top five people I'd love to meet. I'd love to meet my pastor one day. Yeah. It's kind of odd yeah. to say that, but yeah. uh, I love him. And I did hear from a very, very successful young man. Uh, he's a realtor out in Oklahoma City, and that was his one tip whenever asked, like, what made him successful? He said, listen to all of Craig Rochelle's leadership podcasts. Whether you're a Christian or not, he, does not, he doesn't sway one way or the other. Listen to those podcasts, though, and they're so nice. Just go ahead and listen twice. Well, now I got to tell on myself a little bit because whatever you help me get on there is is I keep listening to the same ones over. So there's yeah. like three of them. The, his first three, and I I've just so actually I've only listened to like the same three. I listen to them <laughs> a lot. So They're really I need good. You to, this is kind of how new I am to technology. Yeah. I guess, and uh, but I do know the difference between an email and a text now. I've kind of figured yeah. some of that stuff out, but, but uh, you're doing so well. <laughs> I got a. You sent me a picture the other day. I'm so Dude, proud. Dude, I'm feeling like I'm real techy now. <laughs> well, so. Dad, you absolutely embody um, everything that the cowboy world stands for, and this world is a better place because you're here. And I truly believe, if people um, approach business and approach being a father. Approach being a son, approach being a husband like you do, we'd all be better. And that's why I chose you, and, and you've always been the man that led me through some really tough times in my life. Uh, you never avoided the tough conversations. It's no, um, I think it speaks volumes that you knew um, at times when I was depressed or when I suffered from anxiety, and, and you didn't avoid it. You came right to me. Went, Look, you're going to have it. Like, this is in the family. Like, you're going to have issues. Like, let's... But you're never alone. I'm here, and it meant, yeah. it meant everything. And so, um, one last little tip for our listeners before we go, Dad. Okay. You talked about dinner. You talk uh -huh. about dinner and how families don't talk anymore. I had a really cool experience. I I talked to a gentleman that was saying that he missed his his kids are on their phones and they don't have those dinners. Mm -hmm. And you know what I suggested? Candlelight dinners will fix this world. I'm telling you. Yeah. Go have a candlelight dinner with your family because one. You can't see shit. You got to ask each other to pass stuff to you, man. Like, <laughs> yeah. it fixes that. It's real obvious when you're on your phone with a candlelight dinner. Yeah. It's dark. Yeah. But that was something that you and Uncle Brent, shout out to Uncle Brent and Aunt Jan, that's something they believed in. And uh, you want your family to grow closer, throw some candles on the table, shut the lights off, and, and get through dinner. And I, I I beg you, love each other and 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 really get to know your loved ones yeah get to know them and that was something that you never hesitated and you dove in and you asked um you 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 asked those really hard questions and you were there and supported those and uh well, i love that so well thank you son dad you're I awesome it. i love you and and uh man thank you i hope right. hope this works if it doesn't i'm glad i recorded it i'm going to just listen to it by myself hey. so I think you're on to something. Uh, it's your passion. You're not doing it for the money. Uh, your heart's in the right place, and and uh, you're a wonderful listener. I I I think you you're going to be successful. Thank you. Dad. You already are. So <laughs> so uh, I think it's great. Well, so. well, like you always tell me, look good, feel good, do good, and I love you and and thank you and you're an awesome, Daddy. And yeah, let's uh. Let's call this a wrap. So now, once the program stops, I don't have to stop smoking. No, we can still keep okay. going. <laughs> okay. All right. Yep. All right. All Love right. you. Son. Love you, Daddy. All Thank right. you.